name is Ashley, and I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from drugs and alcohol. My sobriety date is June 18, 2017. <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Dear God, let me get out of the way of myself. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll start off by saying I am 28 years old. I guess that would make me a 90s baby. My mom and stepdad raised me. My mom broke her back when she was only 25 years old. The result of that is she's been handicapped most of her life. She's the strongest woman I know. I had a fairly normal childhood, well, normal to me. Looking back, my first memory of being different is when my brother and his friends were picking on me, and eventually I said I wanted to kill myself. My mom had me committed. That's when medication entered my life for the first time, and also the false belief that a pill can fix any feeling. I realized I never felt like I fit in the, with the crowd or even in my own skin. In the fifth grade, we had to take D.A.R.E. In that class, I won a gold medallion for best essay on how to say no to drugs. I never went to church growing up. I never even went to Sunday school. It's not that my family didn't believe in God. My dad just didn't believe in church. Eventually, we moved to Tennessee, where I got a job at Dollywood at the age of 14. It was a magical first job. Not long after working there was I asked if I wanted to smoke weed. Can you guess how I responded to drugs for the first time being asked? I said yes without a second thought. Soon after that, I began to abuse pain medication. The first time I took a narcotic, I felt free, like I was finally comfortable with who I was. In reality, I was just numb to the feeling of being uncomfortable. After the first year of college, I was back in my hometown. My disease continued to progress. I began to sell drugs. No matter what the consequences, I couldn't stop using. My parents kicked me out eventually. I was homeless for the first time. But I had plenty of friends, I mean strangers, that I never felt actually homeless. After a month of not being able to sleep in my own bed and having the feeling of safety and comfort that comes from your own home, I begged my mom to let me come back. We made it down to Florida, and the withdrawals are so unbearable that I would smoke spice while also seeking out gentlemen that clearly had a disability, like a missing arm or a leg, just to feed my disease. After five months of living down here, I find out I'm pregnant. I never noticed the symptoms of the first trimester because I was withdrawing from opiates. My daughter, Sarah Blake, withdrew from methadone the first five weeks of her life. My daughter, that didn't deserve any of this, was fighting for her life because of my actions. Within six months of not working any kind of program, I was picking up a new drug for me. Like any drug, I went to the extreme quicker than ever before. A week later, I was on my way to jail to catch my first charge. I was so scared of being in jail for the first time, I can remember just wanting to lay down and go to sleep somewhere warm, but there was only a cement block in the cell. <laughs> I was released from jail, and I tried to get on the right track because I didn't want to end up there again. I did well until I met a boy early in sobriety, and we began a dangerously codependent relationship. It wasn't long before our relationship became abusive, and then it wasn't much longer before DCF got involved. DCF introduced me to detox. Within a couple of days, I felt like I could take on the world. It could have been being sober for the first time in 10 years, or it could have been the detox medicine. I immediately signed up for rehab, and after detox, I would go to every meeting and, of course, share all the wisdom I had for being 30 days sober. <laughs> I entered into the halfway house after that. I didn't call my sponsor. I stopped going to meetings. I stopped doing anything for my recovery. I relapsed, of course. That little bit of recovery showed me that they are not kidding when they say this disease is progressive. 
I started using drugs intravenously. That led me to the drug that I had been avoiding my entire life. I was introduced to my biological dad's drug of choice, and I was captured. I got that feeling back once more, that it wasn't that I felt comfortable in my own skin. It was that I was too numb to feel. My disease led me to losing my daughter and getting kicked out of my parents' home. I couldn't stop robbing my mom for everything she had. I didn't care that she was actually in pain. I just needed another one. After several halfway houses, I still couldn't stay sober. I met with DCF and told them that I needed a year-long program. I got on the waiting list for a program, and while sitting on the waiting list, my disease told me I just need, needed to take care of me until then. One night, my dad breaks open the bathroom door to find his daughter turning blue. My parents had to witness their daughter overdosing. I don't know if anyone here has ever been brought back to life, but the next day you feel off, like something's missing. As I sat on the waiting list for rehab, I caught more felonies. After a month in jail, I ended up for the first time in my life truly homeless. I would walk around all day aimlessly, just wishing I had somewhere inside. I could sit down and rest. The longest night of my life, I walked to the nearest gas station at three in the morning and found the dumpsters with a fence around it. That was the perfect place. I just needed some rest. I was so exhausted. Eventually, I made it to jail safely. I spent the next five months there. I signed up for Justin's Place recovery program while in jail because this time I didn't want to walk out of those doors without a concrete plan in place. I don't know why I'm standing here today telling you my story. I don't know why I'm here. And so many of the women in jail didn't just relapse, but they died. But I thank God for the grace he has poured over me. I was released from jail at 6 a.m. A.m. The enemy tried to keep me that day, but God's will for me was stronger than ever. I walked into Justin's Place Recovery Program on November 1st, 2017. I can remember sitting on my top bunk in my bunkie, having a sponsor day one and reading her big book and Bible. I would try to be like her, but I would always fall asleep and the Bible would fall off my bed and hit her in her sleep. <laughs> Hopefully, she worked through her fourth step on that one. At this time, I really only opened my Bible or my big book when someone was influencing me. I can remember finding a children's storybook Bible in the director's office. I started reading every night to the women in the room. I loved that book because I could understand it. I was finally able to understand when the other woman would reference different stories in the Bible. This is the first time that I had hope that I could be a warrior for God. Let me share with you the first time I felt the Holy Spirit's presence. It was a normal Sunday morning. All the girls were at Christ Central for church. I was just standing next to my best friend now, but at the time just another girl in the program. She had her hands up in the air while praising God. I was being influenced to do the same, but I was scared that she would hit me if I closed my eyes. <laughs> I slid over slightly and closed my eyes while lifting my hands. I was praying to feel God's presence like the other girls. When I opened my eyes, in the distance, a flag was waving with the name Jesus on it. And all of a sudden, I started crying uncontrollably. It's like God's spirit was softening my heart in that moment. I got home from church and I shared my experience with anyone that would listen. I couldn't believe it. After that, I wanted more. I started reading my Bible in the morning during quiet time. I started taking that time as the most important time of the day. When I spent time with God, I felt comfortable in my own skin that day. 
As I continued my journey in recovery through seeking God in my own time and growing as a godly woman, I found my personal relationship with God through Jill's place. But it was so much more than that. I learned how to do laundry properly. How to fold your clothes as soon as they get out of the dryer. I came into the program and just crumbled up my clothes and threw them in the dresser. One of the girls helped me fold them and put them away. Another girl taught me how to donate the old so that I can make room for the new. Through Jill's place and being in recovery, I learned how to be a woman. Some could say I grew up in that year. I'm still growing. As I stepped out of the boat, a door opened for me to move to Naples. I started working as a cashier at one of St. Matthew's House thrift stores. God revealed to me in prayer that I didn't have to be a case manager to help the hurting. My friend Ashley once said to me that God might reveal to us the destination, but that doesn't mean that the route will be clear. God's calling and purpose for me is bigger and mightier than I could even imagine. I must stay the course. Once again, down in Naples, another girl offered me rides to AA meetings in church. I started going to AA meetings every single day in church on Wednesdays and Sundays. I look back on my journey, and I realize that the community of women are what helped keep me sober. If I had moved to Naples and didn't work a program, didn't have rides to meetings, I don't think I would be standing here today. Look around you. Look around. Some of the men and women will be a part of your journey. You just have to ask for help. I believe AA is a part of my journey because I see tangible evidence of people staying sober for the rest of their life. I want to die sober. I don't know what that looks like, but I do know I must put in the work. So with another so with another woman in the program pushing me to get numbers and get a sponsor, I was able to finally sit down with a sponsor and start working the steps. Every other time I had tried to get sober, I never worked the steps. I had this fear of the unknown, fear of hard work, fear of not doing it right. I put pen to paper and wrote my first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. It's funny when you say that out loud. Yes, my life is unmanageable, and I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol. It's another level when you make a list on paper of what made your life unmanageable. I cried when I read to my sponsor my list. I couldn't believe some of the things I did to survive. But that was my normal. I didn't see anything wrong with it in that moment. I was scared of my fourth step, which I think most of us are, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. How do I make a fearless moral inventory of myself when I'm consumed with fear? I figured it started with a lot of prayer all throughout. I broke the fourth step down so it wasn't so scary. Sharing every part of my past and present with someone was the hardest thing, but I was desperate enough to want to change, to be better. I wanted a real life where I'm an amazing person to be around. I know that sounds silly, but don't we all want that? Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Let's be honest, I have a lot of character defects. (laughs) My sponsor pointed out a lot through my fifth step that I was still in denial about. She showed me character defects that I was still partaking in with being more than one year sober. Sometimes my ego thinks, I went through a year-long faith-based program. I don't have character defects. I'm a godly woman. But that's my disease talking. (laughs) Through working my fifth step, My sponsor and I made a list of everyone I needed to make an amends to. Before I could start step 10, she asked me to make an amends to my mom, the one I hurt the most. 
Before I made the amends, God walked me through a trial in my life that showed me exactly what kind of mental pain I put my mom through. Every time I talked about it, I cried, not because I was hurting, but because I put my mom through that over and over again. I had the opportunity to make several amends since working step nine, and that's where the spiritual experience happens for me. I remember when I saw my grandpa for the first time in recovery. I didn't even know I had to make an amends. I hugged him, and we both cried. I could feel the Holy Spirit come over me and wash away the hurt and pain. Each amends was different for me. As I went through 10, 11, and 12, some days were harder than others to practice these steps. I've had some kind of commitment in in my recovery journey. I've taken meetings into detoxes and rehabs. I've chaired big book meetings and helped start the Zoom meetings off in the pandemic. I believe having a commitment in AA has helped me stay grounded in the program at all times. My life sometimes will be falling down around me, but I suit up and I show up for that commitment. They want me to describe how God has transformed me. What comes to mind is that when something bad happens in life, my first reaction isn't to escape through drugs and alcohol. Today I live in the solution. Today, I'm allowed to drive on the road legally. (laughs) Praise Jesus. I also, for the first time in my life, have my name on an apartment lease. Today, I pay my bills on time. (laughs) Being a grown-up in recovery is a hard job. I'm not kidding. It's a hard job. (laughs) That's why God made Choose Recovery. We never have to be adults alone. God spoke to me when I celebrated my first year in recovery. He said, God is light and there is no darkness living in him at all. 1 John 1, 5. But then he backed it with, for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. 1 John 2, 8. I couldn't help but walk in his truth that he was speaking over me. Today, I have a personal relationship with God. He has transformed me into a new creation. I seek him daily to grow a strong relationship with him. He continues to open doors for me, but in his timing. I recently started going back to school for my business degree. As soon as he spoke it to me, within two weeks, I was picking out classes with a full ride. (laughs) For the first time in my life ever, I'm able to say I'm a straight A student today. That's only possible because of God's glory. I am currently not sponsoring anyone right now. My home group is the pajama party meeting every night at eight o'clock. COVID-19 shifted everyone's recovery. We had to recreate what our recovery looked like. I, I stand here today because God wanted beauty from ashes. I'm just a nobody trying to describe God's love at a human capacity. I will continue to seek him. Thank you. Let me try not to trip over this thing. Bring it over here with me. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Can we give Ashley another round of applause? For amazing testimony. So the really cool part about tonight for me is that um, 
that year-long faith-based rehab that Ashley went to, the bunkie whose uh, head kept getting hit with her Bible every night, well, that was me. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Ashley and I were, um, Ashley and I have been on this journey since uh, the first day for me together, so it's amazing to have her come here and share her story with us tonight, so I'm just so grateful for that. And uh, having known her personally like that through most of her recovery and all of mine, I can remember a time where um, we'd be in the room at night and, you know, she'd just get overwhelmed by this fear that maybe it wouldn't work for her. You know, that just all this stuff that she would look around her, and I would do the same thing, and I still do the same thing sometimes. She'd look around her and just wonder why what was working for everybody else wasn't working for her. And so we sit here three years later, right, and God has done such an amazing transformation, and God has just done so much in her life. And if that's something that you're going through right now where you just feel like, if you're here or you're online tonight, if you just feel like, but what if it doesn't work for me? Every single one of us in this room has felt that way at one point in time. And you're not alone. And Ashley shared a lot in her story about not having to be alone. That I, I don't remember exactly how she said it. We don't have to be grown-ups alone. Thank God for that, right? Yeah. But we're here for each other, and you don't ever have to be alone. And I love the scripture where it says the darkness is disappearing and true light is already shining. And so if you're here tonight in this room or you're watching online, whether you feel it or not, God brought you here for a reason, and the darkness is disappearing. And the true light is already shining, and all you have to do is just get on your knees or pray where you're at tonight and ask God to reveal that light to you, just like Ashley did. Ashley asked God to reveal himself to her, and he did, because that is what God does. And so we have these, uh, these spots at the altar up here, and if you want to come up and pray, you can come up and pray. You can stay in your seat and pray in your seat tonight. You can ask God to reveal to you, reveal himself to you, reveal that light to you. Or if you're online, we invite you to pray wherever you're at, get on your knees, stay on your couch, stand in your kitchen, wherever you're at, God will meet you there. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for Ashley's testimony tonight, and God, we just invite you here with us right now. Lord, we just pray that tonight that somebody would come to know you more, that somebody out there would start to see that true light shining. In Jesus' name, amen.